Hey. Welcome, Welcome to the, the Grim, Grim Leftover, Leftover Show, show with, with Grim Grim Grimnir every, every Monday, Monday night at 7, 7 p.m. Eastern on RealReadyMedia.com and RLMRadio.xyz. All right, folks, it is time for another episode of the Grim Leftovers program, and I am Grimnir here to host the program for you and uh, give you whatever leftover news I have available. So, welcome, everybody. We're live on reallibertymedia.com on this March 11th, 2019. Uh, it is uh, 5, well, 5 o'clock here, 7 p.m. Eastern. But it's actually only 4 o'clock, if you know what I mean, being uh, this last weekend. <laughs> was that stupid time change thing, which I hate. Oh, boy. A anyway, so uh, we're, we're here at this fresh, new, old time. It's still 7, if you look at your clock, if you're on the East Coast, but it's only 6. So anyway, welcome to everybody uh, in all the various places we broadcast to, whether that be freedomsnetwork.com or reallliberty.org, on the RLM or, RLM or radio.xyz page. Uh, possibly you're listening in from other places that I'm not aware of. Major Echo says, Mr. Rob Works. Let's see here. Everything looks good. I, I shouldn't have any Echo. But uh, maybe he just heard the Echo on the opening tune, which I noticed last week. But, yeah, okay, good. <laughs> yeah, i I got I to gotta work that little part out there. I don't know why I'm getting Echo on the, on the opening tune. But, uh, but yeah, it's like uh, Echo Chamber City there. Anyway, welcome to everybody here in the RLM chat. We got a great group of folks here. We always do have a great group of folks here. Uh, folks, I, I say, uh, or I, I should I go with uh, Flash's thing, the bots and the bodies. Yeah, the bots, Mr. Barman, and the bodies, me, uh, and Miss Booze Girl, Miss Kate, as Modius Bessie, Chelsea Doni, Meister Brow, Rain Robworks. Roams, then a white, another bot, weather dork, another bot, phantom, not really a bot, uh, and well then, from over there in Utah, uh, anti and beetle and Colfax and a cyborg noodle, kind of half a bot, uh, we got Dakota and Frumpy and Graham Z and Gromit and Java Doctor and uh, JJ's, hey JJ's, how's things over there in Scotland, the Kozu, the Kiss, the uh, Fonwell, I don't know that name, that's a new one to me. Uh, Pwn Sauce and the Sock Puppet, they kind of hang together. Uh, the Tech Man and Uno, which is also a bot that ap apparently will play the Uno game for you or with you or to you. I, 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 don't, I don't know. I don't play Uno. Anyway, welcome to everybody. Hope you had a great day. Hope you had a great weekend and a great time since I last spoke to you last Monday. For those of you that listened last Monday. <laughs> or throughout the week on the podcast, whichever it is, whatever works. I don't really know. Uh, anyway, I got a bunch, a bunch of stories lined up here for you, and some of them are actually not old because I just picked uh, this one, this first one up. Today I saw it posted over there on realliberty.org by a gal named Push a Pencil. And uh, thanks for this post. I read this headline. I said, ooh, that's cool. And then I read the details. I said, oh, screw me. All right, here it is. High Times Magazine from March 8, 2019. New Mexico House votes in favor of legalizing recreational marijuana. Well, I said to myself, yeah, about damn time. Only, then I read the details. <laughs> Here it is. The New Mexico House of Representatives narrowly passed a compromise measure Thursday night that would legalize the recreational use of marijuana in the state. Representatives have been debating about House Bill 356, the Cannabis Regulation Act. Now, you notice they call it the Cannabis Regulation Act. They don't call it the, hey, go smoke some weed act. No, 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 no. They call it the Cannabis Regulation Act because they want to regulate, heavily regulate, and heavily tax as well. But one hour into the discussions, Democrat Representative Javier Martinez, the bill's sponsor, introduced a 
compromised floor substitute that incorporates provisions of the Senate legalization measure, Senate Bill 577, by Republican Senator Mark Murs, uh, the substitute bill was approved by the House with a vote of 36 to 34, with all Republican representatives and 10, 10 Democrats voting against the bill. Here's a key factor. Under the bill's compromise, compromise bill, adults 21 and older will be allowed to possess up to one ounce of cannabis for personal use, provided that they also have a, re a receipt for the marijuana from a licensed source. Cannabis would be available from uh, pri primarily from retail shops operated by the state, similar to some states' regulation of alcohol sales. Privately owned dispensaries would be allowed in areas that do not have a state-run marijuana outlet within 25 miles. Home cultivation of recreational cannabis would not be permitted, although registered medical marijuana patients would still be able to grow their medicine. So you got all that there? You can have up to one ounce of cannabis for personal use, assuming that you have a receipt from a licensed source, which means most likely a state-operated source, and if not, from a privately owned license by the state source. You have to have a receipt with you. Whenever you're carrying your marijuana, one less than one ounce, by the way, <laughs> it's totally ridiculous. Martinez characterized the requirements for the receipt to be carried with the legal cannabis as a difficult concession to the Senate Republicans. You can face criminal charges if you don't have a receipt or other proof of purchase on your person to accompany your cannabis for personal use, Martinez said. Recreational cannabis cultivators and manufacturers would be licensed by the state and regulated by agricultural, health, and environmental officials. Sales of recreational cannabis would be subject to taxes of up to 17%. Lawmakers have estimated that the recreational marijuana would generate 40 to $50 million in tax revenue annually. With these kind of rules, uh, it's un unimaginable. Somebody is trying to call me from Los, Lu Los Lunas. L let, me, let me see who this is here. One moment. Hello? Hello. This is the Hope and Prayer Center Ministry. Bye. <laughs> Hope and Prayer Center Ministry. How did you get my number? Anyway, um, <laughs> I don't know. Before the vote, Martinez offered local media a pragmatic argument for legalizing cannabis. We know for a fact that it's less harmful than tobacco, less harmful than alcohol, yet it is a multi-billion multi dollar industry that is operating underground, unregulated, untaxed, he said. Okay, so if it's less harmful than tobacco, less harmful than alcohol... Well, you're not asking people to carry around a receipt for their alcohol, are you? Do you have to have, if you have some beer in a bag and you're walking down the road, do you have to have a receipt for that alcohol? No. The answer is no, you do not. Can you brew your own beer at home? Yes. Yes, you can. <laughs> and th those things are not uh, to be allowed under this re legislation here. Anyway, last week, local news outlet Albuquerque Business First hosted a panel discussion on the potential economic impact of the legalization of recreational marijuana. At the forum, Shannon Jaramillo, uh, the CEO of Cannabis NM Staffing, said that legalization would bring benefits to the state. Think about a dispensary as a casino, and how many people visit casinos or at balloon fiestas time, said Jaramillo. I think it would impact it po positively. Now, I, I am, I'm going to agree. It's possible that uh, the economic impact could be positive, if only slightly and probably far less than they imagine, 
because of the bizarre rules and regulations they're putting on it. Uh, anyway, there, there's more to the story, uh, but but this compromise bill still has to go through the Senate, which I, I don't know when they were supposed to do that, but uh, there's not much time left in, in this session, this legislative session. So uh, hopefully, um, I don't know. I, do, do I want this to pass? Do I care? Eh, kind of eh on both. It, it, it's really stupid. Uh, but the, these rules they, they put in there on this and, uh, you can't grow it at home. You have to have a receipt and, 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 and it's, it's going to come from the state. It's, it's, it's so stupid. So I, I don't really get it, but there it is for you. So, uh, thanks for almost nothing. <laughs> Not that I'm going to be going to any state run, uh, dispensary to buy any weed <laughs> sorry guys oh boy now this next story could be uh, interesting to certain folks here people like gooberzilla and others that are interested in power rob works and, and his buddy uh but not probably not something that they don't already know but you may not know it and then there we go from Wired.com on uh, today. It was uh, put out today. Uh, you can power a calculator with some LEDs, which you probably may know if you know anything about electronics. So there you go. Uh, suppose you are getting ready to take a physics test. Everything is set, but wait, the calculator battery died. What do you do? If you're extra crafty, you could grab an LED and use it to get your calculator to function again. I know this seems crazy, but it's true. In fact, I, I did indeed run a calculator uh, run a calculator using some LEDs, which uh, he shows you below here. Who, who wrote this? I assume it's a he. It's Rhett Elaine. I don't know. Is Rhett a man or a woman's name? I, I, I have no idea. Anyway, of course, to really understand how this works, we need to look at what LED actually is. I'm sure you have a few in your smartphone, in your pocket. Many video displays use LEDs. It's very possible you've got one screwed into your ceiling light. They are everywhere. Yeah, in my house, they are everywhere. <laughs> anyway, so let's just start off with a diode. A diode is a device that made from two types of semiconductors that are connected together. In one of the semiconductors, conductors, there are extra electrons, negative charges, that can move around to make the material conductor. We call this an N-type semiconductor. The N stands for negative. The other, other type of material is the P-type semiconductor. I bet you can guess what the P stands for. Yes, positive charges. In the P-type, there are actually atoms with missing electrons. These are called positive holes because an electron should be there. But these holes essentially behave like a positive charge. When you put a P-type together with an N-type, you get a diode, a current of negative electrons, which is the way most electrical currents work, enters the N-type of the diode. The negative electrons can move through the N-type of the uh, diode with no problem. Uh, when these charges get together, to, to get to the P-type side, they combine with the positive hole, they fill those holes, uh, that makes it look as if a positive hole is moving in the opposite direction as the negative charge, uh, such that there is a constant current across the diode. I, I don't need to get into all... It, it's, it's, it's fairly simple, actually. Um, although, the, he tries to get a little technical here in this. But he's got some cool videos and such uh, embedded into this. And you can understand... Uh, how diodes can not only be used to produce light, but also to produce electricity. And if you look at things like your solar panels, you're going to see a bunch of diodes in there uh, that are used, that use light coming down from wherever. Could be your, your the, the light on your table, or uh, it could be the sun out there. Even the moon, <laughs> to a lesser degree, because the brighter the light is, uh, the more electricity is produced by uh, by this kind of circuit. So anyway, I'll let you check this out because it, it's really, it's kind of cool. And, but you could build your own uh, batteries, basically, from, from LEDs. So check that out. It, it's, uh, I, I thought it was kind of neat, kind of cool. 
Um, so uh, take it for what it's worth. There it is. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, this next one came out yesterday. I know it's called Leftovers, right? And I'm doing news stories. What, what, what's going on with that? Sometimes when you serve leftovers, you also put some new food there with it. You know, you might have the main course of some leftover roast beef, but when you're not going to use leftover rolls, <laughs> don't mind me. I'm just trying to make up excuses for why I'm putting some new stories in here. <laughs> This is your new dessert <laughs> with your leftover main course. All right. <laughs> uh, from The Intercept, Glenn Greenwald. New York Times expose on the lies about burning aid trucks in Venezuela shows how the United States government and the CLAP, the, what they call the mainstream media, spread pro-war propaganda. Every major United States war over the last several decades has begun the same way. The U.S. government lies, uh, fabricates an inflammatory, emotionally provocative lie, which large U.S. media outlets cr uncritically treat as truth while refusing at air questioning, at air questioning, is that right? Or dissent thus inflaming primal anger against the country the United States wants to attack. That's how we got the Vietnam War, the Gulf of Tonkin crap, the Gulf War, Saddam ripped babies from incubators, and of course, the war in Iraq, Saddam had WMDs and formed an alliance with Al-Qaeda. Lies upon lies upon lies. This was exactly the tactic used on February 23rd, when the narrative shifted radically in favor of those U.S. officials who want regime change operations in Venezuela. That's because images were broadcast all over the world of trucks carrying humanitarian aid being uh, burning in Colombia on the Venezuela border. U.S. officials who have been agitating for a regime change war in Venezuela, Rubio, Bolton, Pompeo, uh, the head of USAID, Mark Green, used Twitter to spread classic fake news, lies. Call it fake news if you want. It's just blatant lies. They vehemently stated that the trucks were set on fire on purpose by President N Nicolas Maduro's forces. Each of the trucks burned by Maduro carried 20 tons of food and medicine. This is a crime if international law means anything, he must pay a high price for this. <laughs> that, that according to Marco Rubio. Yeah, the scumbag that he is. Um, uh, masked thugs, civili civilians killed by live rounds, and burning of trucks carrying badly needed food and medicine. This has been Maduro's response to peaceful efforts to help Venezuela's. Uh, countries that still recognize Maduro should take note of what they are endorsing. John Bolton. Ugh. <laughs> uh, Secretary Tom Pompeo. We denounce uh, Maduro's refusal to let human humanitarian re assistance reach Venezuela. What kind of sick tyrant stops food? Uh, you're the kind of sick tyrant, Pompeo, that stops food from getting to hungry people. Images of burning trucks filled with, with aid are sickening. Then why did you produce them? That was from the U.S. consulate in Frankfurt. Maduro ordered the firing on and burning of trucks filled with humanitarian aid and attacking volunteers is in unconscionable. I condemn the killing of human human rights abuse, killing and human rights abuses committed by Maduro. Lies upon lies. Violent attacks against life-saving aid for Venezuelan people. Mark Green of USAID. As it always does, as it always has done from its inception, when Wolf Blitzer, embedded with the U.S. troops, CNN led the way in not just spreading these government lies, but independently purporting to vouch for their truth. On February 24th, CNN told the world what we will all know is an absolute lie. 
that CNN, a CNN team, saw incendiary devices from police on the Venezuelan side of the border ignite the trucks, though it generously added that the network's journalists are unsure if the trucks were burned on purpose. Other media outlets endorsed that lie, while at least avoiding what CNN did by personally vouching for it, humanitarian aid uh, destined for Venezuela was set on fire seemingly by troops loyal to Maduro, the Telegraph claimed. <sighs> this is all just so sickening. It's just all so sickening. Other media outlets I endorsed the lie. I already said that, didn't I? Uh, uh, the BBC uncritically printed... There have also been reports of several aid trucks being burned, something Mr. Guido, Guido, that's it, I decided to call him Guido, that's right, said was a violation of the Geneva Convention. Yeah, except the people that did it are the ones that are now pointing their fingers and saying this guy did it, as they had intended from the beginning. That lie, supported by incredibly powerful video images, changed everything. Ever since that Maduro burned trucks filled with humanitarian aid lie was repeated over and over as a proven fact on the U.S. news outlets, immediately after it was claimed, politicians who had been silent on the issue of Venezuela or even reluctant to support regime change began issuing statements now supportive of it. United States news, news stars, news stars, is that a thing? <laughs> and and think tank luminaries who lack even a single critical brain cell when it comes to war-provoking claims from U.S. officials took a leading role in beating the war drums without spending even a single second to ask what they were being told was true. <sighs> Saturday night, the New York Times published a detailed video an accompanying article providing that the entire story was a lie. Not just providing, proving the entire story was a lie. The humanitarian trucks were not set on fire by Maduro's forces. They were set on fire by anti-Maduro protesters who threw a Molotov cocktail and hit one of the trucks. And the New York Times video traces how the lie spread from U.S. officials who baselessly announced that Maduro burned them to the media outlets that mindlessly repeated the frickin' lie. While the New York Times article and video are perfectly good and necessary journalism, the credit they are implicitly claiming for themselves for exposing the lie is totally undeserved. That's because independent journalists, the kind who question rather than mindlessly repeat government propaganda, and are therefore mocked and marginalized and kept off the mainstream television, used exactly this same evidence on the day of the incident, when all the lies started to spread, to debunk the lies being told by Rubio, Pompeo, Bolton, CNN, and others. On February 24th, the day the lie spread, Max Blumenthal wrote from Venezuela on the independent reporting Gray Zone site, that the claim was absurd on its face, noting that he personally witnessed tear gas canisters hit every kind of vehicle imaginable in the occupied Palestinian West Bank, and I have never seen a fire like that one that erupted on the Santander Bridge. He compiled substantial evidence strongly suggesting the trucks were set ablaze by anti-Maduro protesters. Oh, uh, where, where I lost my spot. <laughs> anyway, you get the point. They lie. They lie, they lie, they lie. And to, they lie you into accepting war. They want you to love that war. They want you to be behind them in that war. They want you to send your children to die in that war. Anyway, it's a pretty long article. You can, you can go through it. Um, as y'all know, Glenn Greenwald tends to be a kind of wordy, <laughs> a little on the verbose side, uh, although he does tend to get to the truth of the matter uh, quite often. 
more often than not, I would say. All right, so there's that. Oh, yeah, yeah, Kate, Kate's pointing out one here in the chat right now, uh, an article that uh, Hansel, our, our, our famous Judge Dredd here, from the chat posted, call, calling it a leftist rag, uh, that, that uh, Western media fall in lockstep for cheap Trump, Rubio, Venezuelan aid PR stunt. Yeah, exactly, Kate, perfect. Yeah, so there's that, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know what you say, every time. Uh, you know, they, they, he didn't even mention World War II there uh, in, in his list of lies that 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 to lie you into a war, uh, because that one was was, was very heinous. Uh, but I'm telling you, man. Ah, anyway, now we'll get on to some of the more leftover leftovers. So more of the main course stuff. As soon as I have a drink of water here. Those were all the things that you can look forward after your meal, I guess. Maybe, well, maybe one of those was the salad. Because you don't use leftover salad, do you? I don't, I don't really know. I don't, I don't, I don't eat much salad. <laughs> oh, boy. Anyway, this is this one from February 11th there. Uh, from Reuters via the New York Post here. This creepy robot... You know, it's a robot. I don't know how creepy, but... Anyway, this creepy robot uses bionic eyes to draw people from sight. Which, is that really... I mean, it doesn't seem like that big a deal. Anyway, it says, Can robots be creative? British gallery owner Aidan Miller hopes to go some ways towards answering that question with AI da or Ada, if you prefer. <laughs> AI DA, uh, who make who's who her makers are they calling it a her? Doesn't really have a face on it. It's kind of hard to call it a her, but whatever. Who her makers say will be able to draw people from sight with a pencil in her bionic hand. Meller is overseeing the final stages of her construction by engineers at the Cornwall based Engineered Arts. He calls Ada, named after British mathematician. Uh, computer pioneer Ada Lovelace, yeah, Ada, the world's first uh, programmer, world's first AI ultra realistic robotic artist, Ada Lovelace, uh, and his ambition for her, which some of you may be familiar with the Ada programming language, uh, and his ambition for her to perform like her human equivalents. She's going to actually be drawing, and we're hoping to then build technology for her to paint. Miller said after seeing Ada's prosthetic head being carefully brought to life by specialists, individually attaching hairs to form her eyebrows. Yeah, that's important. Anyway, but also perform <laughs> as a performance artist, she'll be able to engage with audiences and actually get messages across by asking those questions about technology today. Her skeletal robotic head may stand disembodied on a workbench, but her movements are very much alive. Cameras in each of her eyeballs recognize human features. She will make eye contact and follow you around the room, opening and closing her mouth as you do. Uh, get too close and she'll back away, blinking as if in shock. Ada's makers say she will have a robo thespian body with expressive movements and she will talk and answer questions. There's AI running in the computer vision that allows the robot to track faces, recognize facial features, and mimic your expressions, said Marcus Hold, the design and production engineer at Engineered Arts. Ada's makers are using Mesmer, lifelike robotic technology for her head, and once finished, she will have a mixed-race appearance with long dark hair, silicone skin, and 3D printed teeth and gums. Uh, Mesmer brings together the development of the software and mechanics of the uh, electronics to produce a lifelike face with lifelike gums, gestures, and a small human-sized package, Holt said. 
Ada will present her inaugural exhibition, Unsecured Futures, in May at University of Oxford. And her sketches will go up on display in London in November. So my, my question would be for Ada, and it's great that she'll be able to talk and walk around and uh, do some performance art and, and do drawings and possibly paintings in the future. But since they've made it a female robot and it's going to be out there doing human type things, is it going to be a sex bot? <laughs> I mean, really, that's what it comes down to, right? <laughs> All this, this other stuff may be great, but you know, <laughs> we're talking that we're talking the, 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 the more serious side here. Will the bot will uh, be wanting to have sex with humans? That's the question. All right. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, next. <laughs> From uh, the mind unleashed, uh, dot com on uh, February 11th as well. Scientists warned plummeting insect numbers threaten catastrophic collapse of nature. Hmm. A new study has found that insect species are facing a critical decline in numbers, potentially spelling doom for the entire animal kingdom. The research, first reported by The Guardian, reveals that a staggering 40% of all insect species are facing a dangerously steep decline while a third are in endangered. I, I'm not going to buy these numbers. They're telling you these numbers. It was a, a, a report, a study done by certain people. I'm thinking they probably have an agenda behind this. Um, there's, I don't, I don't really see a, a decline in the overall insect population. Uh, so they're telling you that because of this report that now there's a dangerous decline in insect population. Yeah, I'm not buying it. Anyway, in the new review of scientific literature from the last 40 years, pub published in Biological Conservation, the authors note the dreadful degradation of biodiversity, noting... The pace of modern insect extinctions surpasses that of vertebrates by a large margin. Okay, but is that a big deal? I mean, just because vertebrates are dying off at some number and insects are dying off at a larger number, that makes sense because there's a lot more varieties of insects than there are of vertebrates. And as we, you should know, Die-offs are normal. They happen all the time. And new creatures are created all the time, too. But they don't mention all the new ones being created. They only mention the ones that are going away. So, is it different than it's been for the last 20 million years? Or however long they've been doing this? Of course, we don't know anything beyond like a couple thousand years. And even that, a couple thousand years, there's not really good information from then. Maybe a couple hundred years... Is about as far as we can go as far as these kind of things being tracked. We have no idea. But they want you to think, oh no, bugs are dying. We're all going to die. Meh. Not so much. I say. Not what they say. But the study continues to say, we estimate the current population or proportion of insect species in decline to be twice as high as that of vertebrates. Right, and as I pointed out, that there's a lot more species of insects than there are vertebrates. And the pace of the local species extinction, extinction eight times higher, it is evident that we are witnessing the largest extinction event on Earth since the, la the late Permian and Cretaceous periods. No, it's not evident. That's a huge lie. You, got, you have no information to, to support that. The decline of insects, which has uh, which has been, I already read that part, uh, holding steady at a startling 2.5% per year. Um, it's holding steady. 
How's that a uh, I don't know, increase? Anyway, uh, bah, 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 where was it? Researcher Francisco Sanchez Bayo from the University of Sydney, Australia, told the newspaper that the shocking rate uh, means that within a century we could see global insect populations simply vanish. You lying piece of crap! <laughs> He says, it's very rapid. In 10 years, you will have a quarter less. No, you won't. In 50 years, only half left. In 100 years, you will have none. Just absolute freaking nonsense. Anyway, insects remain by far the most numerous and varied animals on the planet. There you have it. With numbers estimated to outweigh all of humankind at least 17 times. At least. Uh, probably 117 times. Likewise, uh, they outnumber all sea creatures and land mammals as well. Of course they do. As such, there are nearly 30 million species of insects from the backbone of our ecosystems playing an essential role as pollinators, nutrients, recyclers, and base members of the food chain. The implications of the loss of insects, as if it were true, would be felt first and foremost by creatures whose diets are directly reliant on insects, as they're trying to get humans to be too reliant on insects for food now, such as amphibians, birds, fish, and reptiles. If this food source is taken away, uh, don't worry about it, it won't be. All of these animals will starve to death. They won't. Sorry, Sanchez Bayo, you're a lion piece of crap. Anyway, butterflies, bees, and moths have been among the worst impacted insects. Yeah, well, the, 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 the pollinators, yes, I can understand because of the uh, chemicals being sprayed upon every plant that's out there. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, it's not a problem, and pay no attention to their, their, their nonsense, is what I will say. So, thank you for that one, you lying scum. All right, this one uh, from The Verge on February 12th by Sean Hollister. Now, I, I personally don't have a drone. I don't know how many of y'all have drones. They look kind of fun, but it's it, to me, it's like something, yeah, I might fly it around for 10 minutes at one point and, and put it in the closet. Maybe if I go somewhere, like out, out, out in the wilderness somewhere, fly it around and, and take a look at stuff. But by the time I got back to using it, uh, the you know the battery'd probably be dead or whatever I don't know. It, it, to me, it doesn't seem like a, a real useful thing for my life. Although it could be fun for a little bit. Anyway, here it is. Goober, you're not listening. I'm not answering you. Um, <laughs> <coughs> The U.S. government is about to put a dog tag on your drone. No leash yet, but that might be coming too. That's right. Get ready to stick some ID on the outside of your drone. Starting February 23rd, which already passed, a new FAA rule will require all small unmanned aircraft to have their registration markings visible on the outside of their body. So law enforcement can easily track down and kill their owners, uh, find their owners. In a preview document published at the Federal Register, spotted by Bloomberg, the FAA says the move is in response to terrorism. Specifically, uh, (laughs) terrorism. Yeah. Yeah, you're flying your little... Your, your little home drone as a terrorist. <laughs> anyway, specifically, the risk to conceal explosive device poses to first responders who must open a compartment to find the small unmanned aircraft's registration number. So they, they kind of want like tail numbers that you would have on an airplane, on a little toy. Currently, U.S. law requires that you register certain classes of drones with the FAA and mark them with your ID number. 
Yes, even though the drone rest registration was successfully challenged in court, Trump later signed it into law. Huh. You mean he didn't care? Huh. But the FAA has always let you stick that sticker somewhere hidden like inside your drone's battery compartment. Not anymore. Technically, the rule is currently uh, just in preview at the Federal Register. It won't be published until tomorrow, which was last, uh, last month sometime. And citizens will have a 30-day comment period to respond. But the FD FAA argues that the need is urgent. Urgent enough that it's firing off the rule just 10 days after the pub pub publication. So much for the 30-day comment period. Not that they, not 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 that they pay any attention to the comments that you would have signed anyway. That's not uh, the only drone-related news in preview at the Federal Register today. By the way, the FAA is still poised to majorly relax its rules about flying your drone at night and over crowds of people. The agency now says it won't be doing that until. It can figure out a system to let it remotely track and identify drones at a distance, something the industry is also working on itself. On what sorts of performance and legal restrictions it should place on drones before they're allowed to do those things. All right. Anyway, um, you know, they, 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 people come up with this great technology and the government's got to stick its big ass nose right in your business and then they use fear tactics terrorism to uh come after you it's ridiculous nonsense and so what if they come across a drone and it doesn't have that id tag on it what are they gonna do they can't track it back to you <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> All right, anyway, <laughs> next story. Uh, from Forbes.com, January 18, 2019. Uh, John Coteser? I don't know how you say his name. Anyway, whatever. This Dutch startup converts heat into cold via a Stirling engine. And it could just save the planet. Really? <laughs> By 2050, almost 6 billion air conditioners could eat 30% of global... Could, could, could eat 37% of global electricity, according to those that want you to believe that at the International Energy Agency. Yeah, this is not true, but they want you to believe that. That's because as India and China get richer... And the, and the planet gets hotter, which, again, not true. The people around the globe are buying AC units at levels approaching the United States. Well, the nerve of them wanting to be comfortable. Who the hell do they think they are? They're not Americans. <laughs> but one startup from the tiny town of Enschinad in uh, Netherlands, I don't know how you say that, Enschied, maybe, in Netherlands, aims to change that via a technological marvel that turns heat into cold without requiring energy itself or any of the nasty gases that most AC units use today. The tech... Nasty gases. <laughs> Freon. Anyway, the technology which Sound Energy unveiled at CE Consumer, Consumer Electronics... CES. What was the S for? Whatever. Uh... Uh, last week in Las Vegas, uh, use a process similar to a Stirling engine, which was first conceptualized 200 years ago in the early 1800s. It sounds like magic or perpetual motion machine, but it relies on a very well understood principle of thermoacoustics as, and was originally developed in the United States Department of Defense Research, the company says. The first step is transforming heat into sound. We take thermal energy and we transform this thermal energy into an acoustic wave. Uh, sound energy CFO Roy ha Hammonds uh, told this guy at CES last week or whenever this happened, 
The, the wave travels through a pressurized infinite loop, the blue ring, uh, there's a picture here, uh, on, in the picture, in which it continues to be amplified. The feedback process makes the sound wave stronger and stronger. So far, so good. Energy has a Sound energy has built a machine to turn heat into mechanical energy. But eventually you want more. You don't want to just remove your heat, you also want to return cold. According to Hammond's, a uh, sound energy device does that as well. This huge mechanical power will be transformed into a delta, uh, delta T, lower temperature, uh, down, in the, uh, in the, down in the last two vessels by connecting them in reverse. Uh, the sound waves produce cold by distracting the heat, distracting, is that the right word there? Distracting the heat from the particles in a classical Stirling cycle. If you don't understand how that works, you're not alone. Hammond's tried to comfort him and saying that only about two or three dozen people globally, all experts in thermoacoustics, truly understand the process. It seems quasi-magical, but the company has been shipping commercial products uh, since last September. Sound Energy's first customer was Dubai, which purchased a unit for cooling in a plant which condenses drinkable water from the air. Another government has purchased a unit for cooling in a remote off-grid space. One of the reasons why this high-tech AC unit does not itself require power. The system itself does not consume electricity or energy. It takes 100% of the stack emitted waste energy or solar thermal and converts that for 40 to 50% efficiency. The rest of the heat can get discharged into a cooling pool or the atmosphere, or, if absolutely required, cooled with a standard AC unit. Uh, the, the only parts that potentially use external power uh, to, to run would be a small controller unit for a more precise calibration, and of course pumps to circulate the heat-bearing fluid and the cool fluid out. So, uh, anyway, there you have it. They have this thing, and it, it's apparently working. It takes no power. And why is that not available at Walmart yet? That's what I want to know. How come I can't just go out and get one and cool my house with that? Because, you know, if it actually does what it says it does, and they it must, I guess. I mean, they're selling commercial units of it already. How come it's not the biggest thing in the world out there right now? I mean, wouldn't this be freaking awesome? <laughs> That's... Yeah, so I, I don't know, man, but uh, yeah. Something to think about, something to look at, yeah, yeah. All right. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I myself at one point in time, oh, 15, 20 odd years ago, probably considered myself to be middle class. Of course, that was not actually the case. I mean, if I was middle class, it would have been lower middle class. You know, I, I, I in in the late 90s to early 2000s, I was in the 50 to 60 to 70K range, uh, d depending on what, what year and, and such. But um, I, I was doing pretty well for myself alone, a single person buying a house and all the comforts that could possibly go with it, all that kind of stuff. But I was not really middle class because it's it's a myth. It's not middle class. You people that are making 100, 200K, you're not middle class. You may think you are because you're a lot richer than the poor people that are making 20K or less, but you're still not middle if you look at the people on top that are making many millions per year. Uh, you're far from the middle. <laughs> but they call it middle class because it makes people feel better. Anyway, even those people now that consider themselves to be middle class, and this article is from June 23rd of last year on the New York Post by Larry Gelton, Getlin, whatever, um, is titled, Why the Middle Class can't afford life in America anymore. <laughs> a 
Well, the answer is you were never middle class. <laughs> anyway, after spending his days teaching AP, that's advanced placement, uh, American history and economics at the public Live Oak High School in San Jose, California, Matt Dr- Berry drives for Uber. So there he is. He's, he's, he's working as a teacher at a public high school, and he's still got to drive for Uber. And his wife, Nicole, she teaches as well. They earn $69,000 as a combined salary that not long ago was enough to afford a comfortable family life, as I just told you earlier. But due to astronomical costs in his area, including real estate, a 1,500-square-foot starter home costs almost $700,000. Driving for Uber was a necessity. Teachers are killing themselves, Barry said in a new book, Squeezed, Why Our Families Can't Afford America, out uh, whatever Tuesday that was back back in uh, July. Um, He says, I shouldn't be having to drive for Uber at 8 o'clock at night on a weekday. I should just shut down from the mental toll, uh, grading papers between rides, thinking of what I could be doing instead of driving, like creating a curriculum. And her book, author Alyssa Quart, lays out how America's middle class is being wiped out by the cost of living, far outpacing salaries, while a slew of traditionally secure professions, like teaching, can no longer guarantee a stable enough income to clothe and feed a family, no less home, house. My my middle-class life is now 30% more expensive than it was 20 years ago. Yeah, but then again, like I said, 20 years ago, it was not middle-class either. And it's certainly not middle-class now. When you got to have three three separate incomes, you're not (laughs) middle-class. Anyway, anyway, citing the costs of housing, education, health care, child care in particular... In some cases, the cost of our daily life over the last 20 years has doubled. Well, certainly on health care, since the government got really involved, not that they weren't already heavily involved, but now that they've pretty much taken it over, yeah, it's anything the government touches turned to shit, and, and the price goes up astronomically. In Montreal, where a daycare is a government-subsidized, it costs 7 to 20 Oh, wait, it co- so if it's government subsidized, it costs less to you, the consumer, but overall, it costs tons more. So what they're, 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 they're begging for here is government subsidies. Ah, figured annually for 50 weeks, uh, a, a fi- 50 weeks, what, what would happen the other two weeks? Uh, five days a week, people in Montreal pay seventeen hundred fifty to five thousand dollars per per year on child care. By comparison, Court says that here, many of the families he spoke to uh, were ostensibly ostensibly middle class, were spending around twenty to thirty percent of their income on daycare. So let me just ask you this: How much is your wife making? Is she making thirty percent? of uh, of your income uh, if so let her stay home or, or if you're not making that 30 percent, you stay home <laughs> just say it if if you're spending that much on daycare why don't y'all stay home <laughs> uh anyway it's it's a lot of nonsense but i and and i i've talked about this for years on on the internet radios yeah, because, um, you know, there's no middle class. Middle class has been gone for a long, long time. And, 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 the, it, uh, so you may think you're middle class, but you're not. You're just not as poor as the poor people. And it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. Just look at, look at the trends of the numbers. Uh, as this guy pointed out here in this, that many of his expenses have doubled. Some of them probably gone more uh, up more than that. And you, maybe you don't understand why, but 
Um, it's a, it's, it's the way they deal with money, what they call money, the federal reserve debt notes. That's the reason because they keep making those more and more of those. And you look at this thing, Oh, what do I care about the national debt or just because it's all these trillions of dollars, it's trillion, trillions of dollars that, that shouldn't exist when there was less dollars, your dollars were worth more. And you may say, well, yeah, but I get raises and uh, not to keep up, not not even close. You go you go back and look uh, pr- prior to the the nineteen seventy one and post nineteen seventy one, and you'll you'll understand. And, and people say, oh, let's go back to nineteen thirty. Yeah, that's fine. Go back to the beginning of the Federal Reserve. Look back then. That that's fine, because <laughs> that's when the 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 Federal Reserve was put in place. I don't say that's when it was created, uh, just because it's been, been a lot more than that. Um, a- a- anyway, so if you think you're middle class, you're fooling yourself. But hooray for you, because you're probably making decent amount of cash more than some of your neighbors. Anyway, that, that's that. That's for that one. All right, let me wrap it up with this one, which is an old article. But I just wanted to share it with you because um, I like it. <laughs> and I, I don't know what the numbers would be at this point in time because I said it's an old article, August 9th, 2017. But I came across it the other day and I said, oh, i got to share this with, with those people. Those people, the, the listeners to the Grim Leftovers program. So here it is. Way leftover. Trouble for Big Pharma as nearly 50% of people report quitting pills for CBD. And I hope that number is higher by now um, because CBD is becoming more popular and everybody knows the uh, pills are horrible for you. Anyway, according to a recent survey conducted by the cannabis market research firm Brightfield Group and Hello MD, an online medical cannabis community, Nearly half of CBD, uh, can, whatever, uh, users give up prescription drugs and over-the-counter medi- medications in favor of the non-psychoactive substance. A survey of over 2,400 respondents around or uh, found 42% of CBD users, whether they used marijuana-derived CBD or hemp-derived CBD, have left their traditional medications behind altogether and now use cannabis instead. Hooray. All right, I'll, I don't have time to get through go through this article for you, but uh, you will have time to read it on your own, as I will put the, the, the link here into the uh, chat, and also it'll be in the post, the blog, post-show blog post, which will be up shortly after the program. So, yeah, my peeps. <laughs> Absolutely. Anyway, that, that'll, that'll, that, that'll wrap it up uh, for, for the news stories for tonight. Let me just say, though, thank you all for tuning in. It's, it's, it's great what you do. I appreciate anybody that, that actually does tune into the show and listen in, uh, whether you be from this country or another, and whether you're interested in the news or you just want to hear me yap, because that's kind of what I'm doing here, just yapping, um, telling you stuff. Most of it you probably already know. I don't know. But, uh, but it's kind of fun, and, and I get on here and talk and it's kind of it's kind of cool. Uh, anyway, tomorrow you got uh, Flash somebody coming on at 1 p.m. Eastern with his show, In a Perfect World. Probably not with Vinny. Vinny said he was going to take two to three weeks off. Uh, last Friday he told me that. So um, good luck, Vinny, with whatever it is you're up to and doing. Uh, have fun out there. Uh, okay, but then Flash will be on. And then on Wednesday and Friday evening at 7 p.m. Eastern is Miss Grammy Mary with her show, Grammy's Rocket Chair. It's a great program. She's cut down from two hours to an hour, but it's still a great show. Uh, it's kind of refreshing, actually, to get that one-hour show instead of a two-hour. So, uh, yeah, we all love Grammy, of course. Uh, and then on uh, Thursday is, once again, Flash Somebody at... Uh, see, Flash, I'm not positive on Flash, whether he his time has not changed like it did in the U.S., so maybe he'll go on at his time, whatever his time was and not our time. But we'll just re- keep reporting at his time until we find out differently. Uh, at 6 p.m. Eastern on Thursday is 20% off with Flash Somebody. 
and, that, and that's his solo show anyway. Um, then on Friday evening, uh, like I said, Vinny won't be on Friday at his normal show because uh, he's taking a couple weeks off. But on Friday evening, uh, Gr- uh, Moose Girl, Moose Girl, my, my, my lovely assistant, wait, partner, not assistant. I'm her lovely assistant. Anyway, on Friday night, she's going to a, a show, a concert. So I'll, I'll be doing the, the Freaker's Ball as Balls to the Wall. Uh, so tune in for that at the normal time, 11 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Saturday is Flash again. Sunday is, is myself in the blues and trivia. And Hal Anthony comes up after that. And then we roll back around to Monday. So thanks, everybody, once again. Talk to y'all later. Have a great night, great week. Peace!